The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Thank you for uh, joining us in this uh, historic building, landmark building, uh, in this uh, magnificent uh, room, which I must say I've never been in. And Tony reminded me there, there are several like this uh, throughout, uh, throughout this uh, magnificent uh, building. Obviously, today is a very sad day for, uh, for Abney and for uh, New York City. Uh, we lost a, a great leader, uh, a man who uh, normally would be sitting right at my table. Uh, he was a, a dedicated uh, member and friend to the Association for a Better New York. He showed up at almost every breakfast that we had. Uh, he loved this city, and uh, uh, we will miss him but uh, we, we, we will take uh, the lessons he gave us and uh, use that to, uh, to move our city forward. Uh, it is now my privilege to introduce our honored guest, Anthony uh, W. Marks. Uh, Tony was appointed the president and CEO of the library, of the New York Public Library in 2001, and has worked to expand the library's essential role as a provider of free educational opportunities uh, for all New Yorkers. Tony uh, focused on uh, increasing services to students, researchers, and scholars, improving educational programming in the public library's 87 neighborhood branches, partnering with the city's Department of Ed to increase public school access to critical learning materials, and expanding the public's access to e-books and other data uh, digital resources. Tony, welcome to Abney. We look forward to hearing your, dis uh, hearing your discussion uh, of the future of the New York Public Library, your strategy for integrating technology into the library system, and the importance of the library as an essential educational resource, as well as a cu cultural institution. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome New York Public Library President and CEO, Tony Marks. Mayor Koch uh, oversaw New York at the time when Vartan Gregorian, Andrew Heiskell, and Brooke Astor worked with him to revitalize, uh, really fundamentally, this institution as well as Bryant Park, um, and so the library, uh, as with all New Yorkers, uh, mourn his passing. Um, that, that work would not have been possible without uh, the mayor, without the city council, um, and, uh, and of course, we build upon their foundation. Some of you may have come with some skepticism this morning about what the future of the library and whether we need a library. And let me just tell you, you are not alone in that skepticism. When I told my uh, snarky 16-year-old son uh, that we would be leaving the uh, president's mansion in Amherst, Massachusetts um, to run the New York Public Library, Without missing a beat, the first thing he said was, Dad, you didn't get the memo that libraries are going out of business? <laughs> he then went into his room and sulked for an hour. He liked the mansion. Came back and said, all right, Dad, I've been thinking about it. Um, you picked the only institution I can think of in the world that has zero revenue. <laughs> Welcome to my life. Josh was wrong. New Yorkers know that Josh was wrong, and they prove it every day. The New York Public Library has, every year at this point, something like 18 to 20 million physical visits, up 12 percent just since 2008. More physical visits than all of the cultural institutions and sporting teams in New York combined. People say no one's reading books anymore. Circulation of our books are up to 28 million, up 17 percent just in the last two years. New Yorkers love their library and they depend on their libraries. The recent report uh, that Jonathan Bowles and his colleagues at the Center for the Urban Future uh, put together makes that very clear for all of us. And if you don't want to look at a report, though I urge you to do so, um, I'll tell you, for me, this came home uh, very clearly during the, uh, the, the dark days of Hurricane Sandy. 
Um, we all lived through those days. Um, this institution had most of its branches open within 48 hours before the schools could get open or much of the subway was open. This building was dark for lack of electricity. Um, I was working over at the Mid-Manhattan Library, which is the largest circulating branch library in the country, and I've never seen anything like it. Every square inch of floor, every seat, every plug, every computer, being used by thousands and thousands of New Yorkers, flooding into their library because they wanted to be together and they wanted to get back to the work of the mind that is possible in New York. In hard times, New Yorkers know that the library is their refuge and is the place to invest in the future. For me, pivotal life experience, other than growing up in New York, was living in South Africa in the 1980s when the country was going through a civil war or close to it to try to end apartheid. I worked on education project then, and I saw, I saw people, friends, colleagues, loved ones, willing to give their lives, and indeed giving their lives, for the right denied to them of being able to learn and educate themselves and have access to the world of ideas and information. They did that because they understood, as we understand as Americans, that education is the key to democracy and the future of our economy. If we are to have an informed citizenry, if we are to have an effective workforce, it must be educated. We know that all the more in New York because this is, after all, the center of the information age, the capital of that age. This building is at the central crossroads of the capital of the information age. And it is also fitting because New York is the place that symbolizes and makes real for so many the American dream. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. But we need to make sure that you can make it here. And the library is the bedrock, the foundation stone of access to ideas and information and education. This is the place where the kids come to learn to read. This is the place where the seniors come for a quiet place to be able to read. This institution was founded in order to ensure that possibility with the gift of the city of New York and the largest single act in the history of philanthropy, Andrew Carnegie's gift to the public libraries of New York, brought together in this institution almost uniquely the largest, most used research library in the world and the largest circulating library in America. Let's start for a minute with the branch libraries. Many of you, I assume, grew up using them, as did I. If you haven't been back to your branch libraries, let me urge you to do so. Every seat is filled. People are coming for, their com for our books, for our computers, for our quiet, for our heating, for our air conditioning. And I suggest there is no other place in the city that brings together the people of different economic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, immigrants, natives, men, women, young, old, they're all in the library at a time when we seem to be hiving off into segregated, gated communities. The library is the place that brings us together. And it brings us together to think, to read and to write at a moment when we worry that there isn't enough thinking going on in our society. And that's fabulous and inspiring, but it's not enough. Half of New York is immigrants. 
English as second language instruction. The needs for it have increased 40% just in the last three years, while the provision has decreased for lack of funding. The New York Public Library is the leading free non-city provider of English as second language instruction. In the last six months, we have increased English language instruction twofold, and we aim to increase it tenfold in the next few years. The New York Public Library is the leading free provider of basic computer skills training, essential to make it in this economy. Others are pulling back. In the last six months, we've doubled our provision, and we aim to go five or tenfold increase. Every day after school, 30,000 kids come into our branches because it's safe, and that's a great thing. We should be providing them with the finest after-school program in the nation, and potentially the largest, and we aim to do that. And we are conscious of the need to support our colleagues, our great colleagues in the Department of Education. Just this year, as Bill mentioned, we announced that the New York Public Library, in a path-breaking partnership with our colleagues in Brooklyn and Queens, we have become the circulating library for the entire school system of New York. Instead of the students and teachers depending on 10,000 out-of-date books in a small room and a card catalog, which cannot meet the needs for information in the 21st century. Every library and every school in the city will have computers linked to our 17 million books, and we will deliver whatever the Common Core requires and whatever our teachers and our students require. 1.1 million students will use the library every day to boost their achievement, and we all have to help them do that. The library has seen a decrease of city discretionary funding in the area of 20% just in the last five years. $23.7 million less per year since 2008. The City Council, our colleagues here today, Councilman Jackson, Gentile, Van, Jimmy Van Bramer as chair, two chairs there, um, has, uh, have really been valiant in their efforts. But we have less resources at a time when the city needs us to do more. So let me be clear. We need to find a way to get beyond the budget dance. We cannot celebrate the fact that our cuts are not $40 million a year, but only $5 million a year. We're grateful for those restorations, but that's not going to allow us to do what we need to do for this city. We need to baseline city, report, city funding so that we can add private donations, do more for the city, building on that baseline. We are ready to deal. And let me be clear, we need to do so. We are a cultural institution, but we are not a museum. I love the museums of New York, but this is not a museum. This is a library. It is an educational institution. And we need to ensure the kind of support that the Department of Education is able to get and that New Yorkers deserve, because this is the foundation stone of the American dream for New Yorkers. But there's more. There's more than just, just the largest circulating library in America. We know, we all know, like it or not, that increasingly the future is going to be people reading on whatever gizmo they want. Even this size gizmo, much to my dismay. I shouldn't do this, but I'll tell you a story. I was on the subway the other day reading my New York, my New York Times in the old-fashioned way, very cumbersome and uh, on the subway in the morning. The person next to me is reading a book on a screen this size. I look over, I say, snarky New Yorker that I am, I say, that's got to hurt your eyes. And she looks down at her screen and she looks over at my New York Times and she looks down at her screen and she looks up and looks at me and she says, 
my font is bigger than your font. <laughs> Welcome to the future. But the future is not equally available to everyone. More than a third of New Yorkers do not have broadband internet access at home. We face a future in which, after a hundred years of this institution ensuring that a quarter to a third of New Yorkers will have access to books because they can't afford them, that if they choose to read digitally, we will not be able to provide them with that access. That a technology that wants people to have more ready access to information will actually collapse it. When I arrived at the library, only two of the big six publishers who represent 73% of the book industry were willing to even sell ebooks to libraries to lend. We face a future not just of economic inequality, but where the bottom quarter or third of our society won't even be able to read. We will not have a functioning democracy or economy under those circumstances. So I have to be a little careful since we may have some press colleagues here. We started a year and a half ago with two out of the big six publishers being willing to let us have access to e-books. Stay tuned. In the weeks ahead, I believe, I believe, we will see announcements suggesting that all six of the big six are ready to start selling e-books to libraries. This institution has to ensure that access, particularly for the bottom quarter or third of New Yorkers who will be left out of the possibility of reading otherwise. So we've talked about branches, we've talked about the virtual, and you're thinking I'm ignoring the subject that you all probably have been reading the most about, which is this building. Let me ask you to notice the postcard in front of you. I almost never use a prop, but here we go. If, if you were a smaller group, we would be having breakfast this morning in the trustees room downstairs. It is the governance center of this institution. And this is a picture of the mantelpiece above it. Let me read to you the first line. The city of New York has erected this building for the free use of all the people. Until 40 years ago, this building included not only the great research library it continues to proudly house, but a great circulating library moved across the street to the mid-Manhattan. It is time for the circulating library to come back into its home. It is time for this palace of the people to continue to serve the needs of professional and freelance researchers and writers, and this floor will continue to be exactly as it is, but it is time for all New Yorkers to feel welcome in this building, to enjoy here the finest most dramatic circulating library, the largest in the country, if not the world, that we can produce here. So we have a plan. It is to double the public space in this building, because we love this building, and we want more of it to be used, not for staff offices, not for book storage that isn't working anymore, because the books are decaying in those hundred-year-old stacks, we want the people of New York in this beloved building. And we want to make sure that the core of our research collection remains right here so that anyone can get access to it and that it is safely preserved so that people will have access to it for generations to come. Oh, and by the way, the building will be open till 11 o'clock most evenings, little hint buy commercial real estate on 40th Street between 5th and 6th. I, I think I can say that as long as I don't actually do it. 
And one of the amazing aspects of this plan is that we will end up with $15 million more a year to spend on, wait for it, librarians and books because of the benefits of consolidating three facilities into one and the fundraising possibilities made that are po then possible. We aim to create here at 42nd and 5th not to diminish our investment in the research library one iota. We will not touch any of the current public spaces of this majestic building, but we will double the public space and use of this building. And we will create here at the Central Crossroads the greatest combined circulating and research library in the world. Why? Because it's all about education. America is all about access to ideas. We need to ensure that people can learn, come, and read, and produce the next generation of ideas, all inspiring each other here and throughout our system. We remain inspired by the second quote on the inscription on the mantelpiece below. I quote from Thomas Jefferson, I look to the diffusion of light and education as the resource most to be relied on for ameliorating the condition, promoting the virtue, and advancing the happiness of man. It is the founding idea of America. It is the founding idea of this institution. It is a mission to which we recommit ourselves, doubling down our investment no matter how difficult the challenge is, because we must provide to all New Yorkers, to all comers from anywhere in the world, the opportunity to ameliorate their condition, promote the virtue, and advance their and society's happiness. Thank you for joining me this morning. I'd be happy to take your questions. I just want to mention, uh, as it regards to budget, obviously under Speaker Quinn's leadership, we've restored something in the neighborhood of $400 million to libraries over the last five years, so I feel like that deserves a mention and some applause. Um, and it's never enough. We always want more uh, for our public libraries. But one of the effective arguments that we make uh, as it relates to culturals uh, is that they are drivers of the economy. And uh, the truth is libraries are also involved in economic development. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a, a little bit to that as it relates to New York Public Library. Sure. Well, first, let, let me reiterate, as I said, um, the council, uh, particularly Jimmy Yu and, and and, Cal and Councilmember Gentile and, and Jackson who are here and so many of your colleagues have done amazing work. And as I said, you know, those restorations are lifeblood for us and we know how much you fight for them and we're, we couldn't be more grateful. We just, we want to be able to do more. I think, you know, we all feel that passion. I know you feel that passion and have, have been pushing for that before I was an apple in anyone's eye on the scene of libraries, at least in New York. The, um, I, um, I think there's no question, as I suggested, that we are the bedrock of economic possibilities um, because this is where people come to learn. If we can't have a functioning economy if we don't have an informed and skilled workforce. And we are the place where that begins and it's where it's maintained. The science industry and business library, you can go and get free advice any time from experts on how to put your business plan together. You can do the research you need. Uh, Warren Buffett told me in this room not so long ago that for the first three years of his career, he came to this building every day at lunch to do his research so he could figure out how to become the investor that he became. But we need to be even more creative about this. So for instance, one of the things we're talking about is, should we have an incubation lab in this building for information technology entrepreneurs who are working in projects that might contribute to the future of libraries and access to information? I mean, we're open 
to really every possibility because we need to contribute more because you know better than anyone the city needs us to contribute even more. In, in spite of what uh, you might read on the opinion page of the New York Times, most of the people in this room are very excited about the renovation that's happening here at the library and the schedule. I guess the question really is, and it's sort of it's a follow-up to what the councilman asked, how is there a budget for that that's going to carry you through to, to accomplish? This plan is a money generator because it allows us to move the books from storage that isn't working under Bryant Park, where it will be state-of-the-art preservation. So we use that space. Books don't need the view on Bryant Park. People do. We use that crucial real estate to replace Mid-Manhattan without ever closing it, which I will not do. I will not strand a million and a half annual users. And you bring in that and the Science and Industry and Business Library, we can then sell those real estate assets. We have vital support, financial support from the city for this project. We believe we can raise more money because this will be the most significant municipal construction project in a generation or two. And so grateful to Commissioner Tierney and his colleagues for the, uh, the, the strong vote of support from the Landmarks Commission. Not, it, it, what's amazing about this plan is you solve the book preservation problem, you solve the Mid-Manhattan problem, you spend $300 million more or less to do so, and we will stay on budget. We always have in eight years of construction projects throughout the city. And you end up with $15 million more a year to spend, which is like the return on a $300 million endowment. It's like you got the $300 million back and having spent $300 million to solve your fundamental problems. That's amazing. We have to be smart about taking advantage of that kind of opportunity. And then it allows the system to have a financial stability to focus even more resources on the branches and the educational programs I described. I, so what's the problem? Let's get this done. I mean, it's, this is not, uh, does not, doesn't seem to be uh, too, uh, too complicated, but in New York, everything gets complicated. Tony, we thank you. We wish you luck. We're here to help you. And we thank you all for coming. The, the New York Public Library is the library for the graduate programs and many of the campuses of the City University of New York. We are so proud of that partnership. I was with Chancellor Goldstein just two days ago talking about how we can do even more. So we've got, the, for instance, the new community college right here next door using this building. One of the things we're talking about is tripling the space in this building for researchers and scholars, which includes City University graduate students, faculty, other students, so that they can come and have their own space in the building to be able to do long-term projects. We want to be as helpful as we can because City University is a great institution and there's an obvious partnership that we've been building on for decades and we want to do even more with it.